Yeah. Good. It's 12. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon and welcome to the webinar organized by IRV and the Africa Union. I actually welcome you once again in, the, in this conversation around decolonization, decolonizing volunteering and or repositioning volunteering for development. I am the moderator, Samuel Toure. In this um, conversation, we will go into our speakers the expertise of um, exciting speakers within Africa and the Africa Union around the topic. But before the webinar starts, I would like to give you a brief as to how we are right. And uh, I know you can talk. Okay. All right. Can you please mute your mic, please? Okay. So. We we'll give you just a brief background about the topic itself so that you are able to, for the good, you're able to participate very well with the participants. So we all know um, Africa is faced with diverse challenges when it comes to um, volunteering. It's under PNC development and ownership of uh, national volunteer initiative with little or no relevance of traditional or indigenous volunteering. The lack of expertise to advance meaningful and responsible volunteering including data collection as evidence to attract state and non-state actors, investment in traditional volunteering, lack of finance and state recognitions and support towards national tradition, traditional and volunteer engagement amongst others has also been a great um, setback to the goods of traditional volunteering in Africa. However, the contribution of the international volunteer organization has been very visible and valued by governments. Nevertheless, this has also undermined the goods of indigenous volunteer due to lack of collaboration and integration of traditional and international volunteering. The international aid and development sector has been increasingly challenged to decolonize. Research indicates that allocates Sorry, research indicate that allocation, localization of development decision making and delivery has been a long standing response to shifting power with, with the, within the sector. Yet, the rhetoric of decolonization and localization does not always translate to changes in power and practice. These same concerns are also felt within the volunteering for development community. Although COVID 19 has related existing efforts to support certain actors and priorities, it is also highlighted inequalities in resources and support for community and national volunteers and southern based volunteer involving organizations. In the framing paper for IFCO 2021, the case was made for challenging whose knowledge counts in volunteering for development. This was done by Arsene Moina um, in 2021. While the connected think piece highlighted how technology we use can restrict understanding of what volunteering and development means, done by Okech, Bill Smith, and um, males and fathers in 2021. In this webinar, we will explore what the Global North can do to extol, center certain expertise in reimagining the connections between volunteering and development to deliver transformative change. So this is uh, just a brief of what the this webinar will cover. We'll look at in terms of decolonizing structures and looking at how we can position volunteering in Africa the, look, the traditional volunteer programs. And this webinar is in line with the International Volunteers Day, co-organized by the Africa Union. In this, um, to take us through, we have lines of speakers. Um, just can you take us to the next slide, please? The lines of speakers who will be presenting in this webinar. We have Daniel Aduna, Program Manager, Africa Union, Youth Volunteer Corps in Ethiopia. We have Mary Lambo, Founder and Executive Director, Lungelo Youth Development, South Africa. We have Dr. Robert Toy, international consultant, senior expert in volunteerism in Burkina Faso. We have Dick Lady, a 
uh, Makwena, co-founder of Uyosa Women's for Public Lectures, Leadership in South Africa. I actually want to welcome you once again as we um, open the conversation and over to our speakers. I will start with our four speakers to um, lead the session with um, Daniel Aduna. He will take us through the presentation from the Africa Union. Daniel. Right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sam. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, uh, wherever you all are. It's a pleasure and honor to be here today and seeing by the attendance numbers, it really shows how timely and relevant this topic also is. Um, uh, myself, uh, as already introduced, is my name is Daniel Adunia. I work with the Youth Division of the African Union Commission, the Directorate of Women, Gender and Youth. I'm responsible for uh, volunteer programs and generally youth development programs on the continent at the African Union level. So uh, my intervention would also be framed within the African Union space. Uh, I would start off by tackling from the question of the topic of the team, and that is volunteerism in development and then decolonization. So I'm looking at it from two perspectives. One, the decolonization itself, and then development to start with. So uh, let me start with the development aspect and just start by saying, asking ourselves uh, the question and reflection, where do development paradigms, development priorities, development agendas come from? So we all know uh, wherever we are based, uh, almost every country has what we call uh, vision 20 something, vision 2025, vision 2030, uh, transformation goal, development goal, and the like. Uh, then Um, Daniel, we can hear you. Um, can you can you hear us, Daniel? We lost you. Hi, Daniel. Okay, so we lost Daniel. Uh, maybe we will come back to him because of in case of time, we need to move ahead. I will invite um, the next speaker, uh, Mary, to come in. Why is um, we await Daniel? We can get Daniel to continue after Mary. Mary, are you available? Um, Hello, Mary. I think, hi, Sam. I think Mary is offline. I think okay. we're just having some issues with internet. People's connections are not really working. Um, I believe Dr. Toei is online now. So if you want to go to him next. Hi, Dr. Toei. Dr. Robert Toei, are you, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Perfect. Okay. So uh, we can, you can come and then. Daniel will come after you, and I'm sure you missed up short with um, technical problem. But before you come in, I want to remind all of you that you can be able to participate at the Q&A, um, drop in your comments or questions to our panelists around the topic here. We can be able to address them during the Q&A session. So as you listen, please feel free to comment in the Q&A section. Again, I'm once again, Samuel Tilly, your moderator. Yes, Dr. Robert Stray, over to you. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, good morning to all participants to this uh, webinar. 
it's a pleasure to have uh, an opportunity to exchange with you. Uh, it's always uh, uh, an opportunity to, to learn from each other. I uh, will try to share my screen. Uh, do you see my screen? Not yet, so not, not yet, not yet. Please um, try okay. again. Okay, it's coming. Do you see it now? Not yet. Oh, let me see. Do you see it now? It's supposed to be coming very soon, so we'll give it just a few seconds. Okay. Uh, Jess, would you want to share your screen for Dr. Toy? Because it seems to be challenging. Yes. Yeah, if uh, Jess can uh, share because she has a presentation, I can just go through it. Okay, perfect. She can be helpful. Just please stop sharing, Dr. Toy. Do I stop from my side? Yes, yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Oh, it's up now. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. So can we go to the next slide? So the presentation uh, has the following structure. I will go quickly through some key concepts and uh, a brief on some perception of volunteers in Africa. Then we will go through the four points uh, that we have been asked to address in our presentation, and then we will have conclusion. Next slide, please. So in terms of, uh, we have to understand first, the, when we talk about decolonization, what are we talking about? In the basic uh, terminology, it could be just to allow a country to choose its ruler to become independent. Some will also say it's a withdrawal of settler from the country. But in general, we can say that decolonization is the process of political, economic, social and cultural independence of a nation that has been dominated by a foreign government. That's what I will consider as uh, the concept in this presentation, which means that uh, when it's come to volunteers, what we want is to be able, we African, uh, to have a say when we talk about volunteers in our different countries. And as you know, some of the consequences of decolonization uh, was that many colonizers thought that they were doing a favor to, to us. So they tried to introduce their way of life and sometimes also destroy our established culture uh, way of life. So that's led even sometimes to uh, discriminatory and racist belief to justify this harsh authoritarian leadership they were imposing on us. But even though uh, most of our country now are, uh, I would say all the countries are independent, uh, there is still what we call uh, the neo-colonialist, which is the process by which uh, the former European colony are still subject to indirect form of control by a foreign power, despite their uh, political autonomy. And we know that we are the two, two, two main points when it came to decolonization in Africa. Some country got it uh, in a very pacific way, and some country had to fight to get uh, uh, their independence. Next slide, please.
So we're talking also about uh, volunteers. Uh, there is a three key defining characteristic of volunteers. The first one is that the activity should not be undertaken primarily for financial reward. Although the reimbursement of expenses and some token payment may be allowed. So we are not saying here that volunteers should not receive any financial reward, but the motivation to be called voluntary activity should not be primarily financial reward. The second is that the activity should be undertaken uh, by one's uh, individual free will. This is important because as we know, we have in some countries, for instance, uh, uh, civil service that is mandatory. And some people say it's, it's a voluntary. No, if it's mandatory, it's defeat the second characteristic of volunteers. The third one is that the activity should be of benefit to someone other than the volunteer or to society at large. But we should also, again, as I said in, in the first one, we are not saying that volunteers will not benefit the volunteer. Uh, volunteer bring a lot of uh, benefit to a, a volunteer. Uh, like for young people, it can enhance their uh, employability and so on and so forth. Next slide, please. So uh, in 2001, uh, a group of uh, uh, United Nation member state, 126, uh, came together and came out with, with a, a consensual definition of volunteers. Uh, unfortunately, I've been trying to get the list of these member states. I never got it. Uh, I know only that there, are, there were some, a few African countries. At least I know one participant at this meeting who was from uh, uh, a former minister from Mozambique who was there. So we can say that the African uh, um, values also have been taken into account in this definition. So the definition say that the term volunteering, volunteers, and voluntary activity refer to a wide range of activity, including traditional form of mutual aid and self-help, formal service delivery, and other form of civic participation, undertaken of free will for the general public good, and where monetary reward is not the principal motivating factor. So we see again in this definition that we have the three key defining characteristics of volunteers. Next slide, please. Some of the perception that I hear very often have been traveling uh, in many African countries and outside the uh, uh, African continent as well. What we hear very often is that Africa is opposed to volunteer from the North. That, uh, the, the flow is always north-south. Another perception is for what I hear from some people that traditional form of volunteers are not uh, always included in the development of regional and national volunteer program. I've read a lot of law uh, that ex uh, on volunteer that exists. Very few refer to the traditional form of volunteers or take that into account when it's come to programming and planning of uh, voluntary activities. But it start to, to change, but it's still uh, at a very slow space. Uh, voluntary involvement organizations in Africa have to rely on donors from the North to fund their activity. This is something we hear very often also. But again, it's very often that we are not taking into account the traditional form of volunteers that existed even before the colonization period and continue to exist without any support, external support. Some people also say the volunteers from the North are more professional and can mobilize resources for their host structure. We have seen that if you put together two volunteers, one from the North, one from the South, if you go to a rural community, people who have a tendency to consider immediate level volunteer from the north as your boss between quotes. Next slide, please. 
So now, if we come to the fourth point that we were asked to address, um, shift, have to shift the decision making at all stage to southern organization and stakeholder. Let's think of the definition we gave to decolonization. It means we should be able to have a full control on how we want volunteers to contribute to peace and development in our country. So as we're talking about shifting, it means we still have a partnership with a foreign organization. And the shift should come to the way we design our partnership uh, uh, agreement. And for me, uh, a good partnership is the one in which the parties commit to sharing work, resources, power, benefit, as well as risk, decision making, and responsibilities in a win-win spirit. Because what we see very often, sometimes we cannot even change the agreement that, uh, that is proposed to us. They say, this is our format for agreement, just sign on it. And decision will usually be key decision will be taken at the level of a partner in the North. Resources are flowing only from North to South. So we have to reverse all that if we want really to shift the decision-making to Southern organization. There are some good practices that I'm mentioning here. Uh, FK Norway, for instance, when they want to, to engage in a partnership, they will do first a feasibility study. And in this feasibility study, both parts will come together to discuss and uh, arrive to uh, a proposal that is a win-win situation from both sides. I think this can be considered as a good uh, uh, example that we can build on if we want to shift the decision-making. Uh, the second one is uh, France Volunteer, that is the French uh, volunteer program. They have uh, what they call the reciprocity uh, program, whereby uh, this program allows young uh, volunteers from African countries to volunteer in France. Of course, it's not still optimum. It's not like if you have 10 French volunteers in Mali, Mali will send 10 to France. But at least it's a, it's a start. Uh, we have also the African German Youth Initiative. That was not only focusing uh, exclusively on volunteers, but in exchange of young people, including a uh, youth volunteer. Unfortunately, this program came to an end and uh, I don't think it has been renewed. But the idea behind it, I think was also a good one. It was exactly to allow the exchange of uh, young people between Germany and African countries. This was uh, piloted in uh, three to four countries. I think there was South Africa and Benin. But uh, as I said, I think uh, it has not been extended yet. Uh, maybe they're still thinking on the result of uh, evaluation they did. Next slide, please. The South-South collaboration, knowledge sharing and exchange. I think we already have some example of South-South uh, volunteering by Africa that is still uh, at the early stage, but uh, the Economic Committee of West African State that, that has uh, a volunteer program, for instance, is, is, is time among African countries. I know, for instance, Togo and uh, Niger are exchanging uh, volunteers. So uh, national volunteer 
will go to Niger. And in return, Niger also will take some of its national volunteer funding from the national budget of Niger and send to Togo. And each one will pay the, the volunteer living allowance that they're normally giving to their volunteer. And the volunteer will receive also the equivalent of the volunteer living allowance of the host country, which allow them to, to have a, a, a decent life. And I think this is something, for instance, that we can easily um, promote, especially uh, among countries where there is official state-owned national volunteer program with uh, funding from the national budget. Uh, of course, another South-South uh, uh, promotion of uh, volunteers is uh, these existing uh, volunteer uh, involvement organization, uh, such as the African Union Youth Volunteer Corps. I mentioned the ECOWAS Volunteer Corps uh, program that allow young people from the region for ECOWAS only in the, among the 15 member states where volunteers are recruited from all 15 member states and sent to uh, the different uh, host countries. Uh, it's the same for the African Union. That is a, a good opportunity from young people from different countries to go and serve in other countries. I think those are also type of program we should encourage. I know the East African community has launched also a, a, a program. Uh, SADC has approved the launch of, of a program. So I think if all these programs come together, we will be able to improve the South-South collaboration, the knowledge sharing and exchange. Anyway, African Union Youth Volunteer Corps has already taken the, the lead with its linkage platform where we can access information from the different uh, countries. So it's a start, but I think we are on a uh, good path. Then you have South-South volunteering promoted also by international and bilateral organizations, such as the United Nations volunteer, where you can recruit volunteer in uh, Malawi, will go to serve in, uh, in Mali and uh, so forth. Myself, I've served as a, a, a UN volunteer, for instance, in uh, Zimbabwe and in Mozambique, while I'm from Burkina Faso. So this is also a promotion of South-South uh, volunteering. We have a volunteer service overseas. Initially, they were only sending citizens from the UK to African countries, but uh, uh, now, uh, they allow also recruitment of volunteers from African country to other African country. I see someone say that uh, the name of uh, the Norway organization, Norwegian or an exchange to NOREC, uh, we take note of that, but what is important is more the idea that was uh, behind uh, their uh, program. So again, instead of FK Norway, that we should say NOREC. Next slide, please. Supporting Southern investment volunteering from government and the private sector. I think uh, some, some initiatives have already been taken in uh, this area. Uh, the launch of the International Year of Volunteer has served a lot to boost uh, the establishment of a volunteer program funded either by a civil state organization or by a government. We have to take uh, stock also of the African Union, uh, African Youth Charter, uh, in which it was uh, requested to member states to promote youth volunteerism program. I think that's also helped help uh, a lot when I was working with some countries on the establishment of national volunteer program, I will pull this uh, article and say, 
your country as a sign on the African Youth Charter, it means therefore it is important for you to go through this uh, program. So it's helped uh, to get the buy-in from uh, government. In some countries also, it's a move to address the growing youth issues such as unemployment by enhancing their uh, employability. We know very much about the famous uh, first experience in, uh, for, in, on the, uh, the work market. If you don't have first experience, you don't have the first job. Without a first job, you don't get the first. So, you are locked in uh, this vicious circle, but volunteers can allow young people to break uh, this uh, vicious circle by getting their first experience through uh, volunteers. And very important also is the advocacy by civil society organization and the international community. But in our case, talking about the colonization of uh, volunteers, it's important to think how our different civil society organizations can come together to uh, advocate for volunteer program, for laws on uh, volunteers. We have to know also that uh, uh, when, when we look at the ratio, uh, the percentage as total number of volunteers in Africa, the formal volunteers uh, represent 13.1%, while the uh, informal volunteer is almost 70%. That's compared to, uh, if we go at world level, is 30% for 70%, which means that most of our volunteers are not even within the structure type of volunteers. So if we want to decolonize volunteers, we have to take this seriously into account. Next slide, please. So as I said, we have a, a, a lot of uh, traditional form of volunteers. There is a, I have a long table with a name from different countries. But for the sake of time, I'm not going through that. But what I did was to look at the literal translation of the terminology we are using when we're talking about that. So what comes up uh, very often, we see the word mutual aid, selflessness, something done for others, solidarity that is actually the theme of this year, International Volunteer Day. So before even we got in touch with a colonization, the colonizer, we had those traditional form of volunteers. So we need to keep that uh, in mind. And from this terminology, I've tried to come up with a kind of definition of a traditional form of volunteer that is selfless and free will action of solidarity that contributes to others and is recognized and valued by the community with no or minimal monetary or in-kind compensation to a participant. It's more or less what we saw also in the general definition as uh, put forward by the General Assembly of the United Nations. Next slide, please. I'm giving here some of the uh, uh, modern form of uh, volunteer. There's still some uh, French in it, but uh, you can see at least the, the name the, at the continental and regional level. We have African Union, we have uh, ECOWAS volunteer program. At country level, we have Benin, Burkina Faso, Cape Verde, Cote d'Ivoire. Next slide, please. Uh, Gambia, Guinea, Guinea-Bissau, Liberia, Mali. And if, if, if you look closely at these countries, you will see where the program is very functional and is getting funding from the government 
is where you have a law on volunteers. So it's, uh, this is an important element we need to take into account if we want to get uh, investment in volunteers from our country. This doesn't mean, I'm not, just, I'm not saying that uh, volunteers undertaken by civil society organizations is not important. It's even very, very important because we saw that the informal uh, volunteer represent almost uh, 80% of the total volunteer serving in Africa. So it's important to take that into account. Next slide, please. Yes, we still have Niger, Nigeria, Senegal, Togo, all these countries apart from Nigeria also have laws on volunteers. Next slide, please. Then we have uh, how we can support investment in uh, uh, voluntary for government and the private sector. I think on the, if we look at the research side, I think a good collaboration with academia can help us in this investment. Uh, there are students who would like to do maybe a, a master thesis on uh, voluntary even at the level of a uh, doctorate level, people can uh, do that. So we can support and encourage some of the students to, to do that. And also, I think there, there were some idea in West Africa to set up a regional center on volunteer dedicated to research and training on volunteers. I think we need to encourage, to support those type of initiative in the different region, and that can help us in this way. Next slide, please. We have a few minutes left. So, how can we decolonize volunteers? So, based on all I've been saying in the previous slide, I think we need to continue the advocacy for more national and regional volunteer program with laws and funded by the state. But we should not stop just at having a program that will recruit volunteers and fill them. But this program should have also a component that support national volunteer involving organizations. Because as I said, they play a very important role in the voluntary sector. We need also to value the traditional form of volunteers if we want to decolonize uh, volunteers. Uh, example, uh, uh, in the policy of Rwanda is fully grounded on the traditional form of volunteers. And it seems to work. I've been just once in Rwanda, but what I've seen is work. And lastly, we need to take more seriously into consideration the informal volunteers who represent almost 87% of the total number of volunteers serving in Africa. Next slide, please. So this is my last slide. I want to leave you with uh, some quote from some of our uh, great leaders. Uh, Patrice Lumumba, who was a Congolese leader, said that Africa will write its own history and both North and South of the Sahara, it will be a history full of glory and dignity. This was said in 1960 when most of the uh, African country got their independence, but it's still true today. And that's why we are discussing topics such as uh, decolonizing volunteers. Sustainability could be through uh, voluntary state-driven processes, taking into account country context. Every country has its own context. Uh, but when it's state-driven, we have a chance to get a part from the national budget dedicated to volunteers. Countries where it's not fully state driven, they have to rely on their own um, resource mobilization strategy. So then engage in innovative voluntary partnership. We saw already what I, I meant by a, a good partnership. And more than now than more than 
than ever before, it is time for each and every citizen, stakeholder in the continent, government, private sector, NGO, academia, individual citizen, to pull together and take advantage of voluntary, inclusive, mutual partnership as a powerful mechanism towards bridging implementation gap and realizing the dream of a prosperous Africa. And uh, Thomas Ankara, our the former president of my country said, the slave who will not shoulder responsibility to rebel does not deserve pity. So I think we are shouldering responsibility as we have decided to have this specific topic to decolonize volunteers in Africa. Thank you, I think I was uh, in the time. And uh, when we get to question and answer, if there are any clarification, I will be able to come back with more detail. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mogabatoye, for this insightful presentation. Thank you so much. And once again, you can you have the chance to ask questions um, in the QA. Uh, you can post your questions and comments regarding the topic we're discussing here. Again, I now call on Daniel Aduna from the Africa Union to continue his presentation. We are we lost him before. We have to get him now. Hi, Daniel. Over to you, please. Hi, uh, Sam. Can you hear me now? Perfectly, yes. I'm sure everyone can hear you. Yes. My sincere apologies. I don't know if my technology failed me today miserably, but uh, in hindsight, I am uh, happy that uh, Robert made his presentation because uh, really he touched on many, many of the key things of what is happening at the continent African level. So which makes uh, even my presentation much more easier and in complementary uh, really Thank you, Robert, for that presentation that is so rich and so uh, insightful. We always learn uh, from you, Robert. Uh, thank you so much. So uh, I, want, I want to build on what uh, Robert uh, has said, and that was actually my main presentation as well. A key driver uh, for us uh, at the African Union when it comes to decolonization or development agenda, it's the simple uh, point where we say, what is your own agenda? What is your own development aspiration, uh, both as a continent, as a nation, as a community? Uh, if we don't have those, then we cannot be asking for uh, decolonization, driving our own development agenda, uh, if somebody else is setting those agendas. Now, fortunately, uh, almost all of our countries, uh, or at least those countries that I've interacted on, and uh, I see a huge number of participants in can call a test. Our countries have our own development agendas. Almost every country has Vision 2020, Vision 2025, Vision 2040, development goal this and that and so on, which comes uh, from internal development needs and aspirations. Then you go to sub-regional levels and you would see uh, whether it's ECOWAS, whether it's uh, Central Africa, whether it's Southern Africa, they all have the development goals. And then at the African level, we have the uh, Agenda 2063, which seeks to for a prosperous, integrated, peaceful Africa driven by its citizens a 50-year action plan uh, that brings the continent together. And then you go even further at the global level, we have the SDGs. Now, the key determinant for me, uh, what, when we say about development is that one, knowing your agenda, many of us, when I ask the uh, people I talk about, when people ask me, African Union, you guys are not doing anything. You know, what is your agenda? like your agenda 2063, is it even working? Is there any integration on the continent and so on? And obviously, of course, we're not where we want to be, but then I ask people uh, how much of agenda 2063 or the mandate of these institutions like African Union or UN or even your own national government do you know? Then I ask people even, uh, have you read uh, your national development plan? at your country's level, uh, 
uh, your vision 2030 or so. How many of you have read it? Um, your national constitution, how many of you read it? And I, I stand to be corrected. There was an article once I read from a country where they did a survey of parliamentarians who are sworn in and how many of them know the constitution? It's say more than 75% of the parliamentarians who swore in have never even read the constitution they have been swearing in. And I think this shows a key question, begs a key question for us, knowing our own agenda, not having it written alone, it's not enough, but knowing, implementing it and going further into the development. That is uh, one point that I want to uh, be set and anchored today. A second one is that there's always that notion where we ask ourselves, and I think Robert said it very finely, are we in competition with these different notions, international volunteer, national volunteer, uh, grassroots volunteer, and so on. And I believe it's our thinking, our schooling system that has put us in a box uh, where we have to think black and white you are with us or against us. Uh, there's only light or darkness, so you have to choose a side. And I think Africa has always been that center for non-alignment. And uh, our Pan-African ideology is always in complementarity and in continuum. We don't say the opposite of light is darkness. We say they coexist. For light to be, there needs to be darkness. For darkness to be, there needs to be light. And in such notion, when we say we're not against international volunteerism, the North volunteers, South volunteers, East volunteers, South volunteers, West volunteers, what we're saying is that all formats of volunteerism need to be in a complementarity format. Just like the different development agendas, we don't have to uh, ditch national, national development agenda to implement SDGs or agenda 2063 of the African Union. The foremost, the basic starting point always is the grassroots level, community level development agenda, how you develop it. And then because we don't live on ourselves, we integrate our development with our neighbors, with our surrounding. That's where ideas like Agenda 2063 uh, and continental integration aspiration come in. So all these things are in complementarity. But I always say people, you cannot know where to do complementarity if you don't know where your own development agenda lie. And that thing, I believe, um, is a second point where I want to raise. So uh, complementarity, knowing your own agenda, and then going to the volunteer space, then now we say that we want to do complementarity. And now uh, the next level is to say, we need to recognize the same way as we want to count the contribution of national volunteer program, regional volunteer program, international volunteer program, just as we write the contribution and the report, we want to capture all volunteerism contributions, even at grassroots, uh, all the definitions that have been made, whether it's mutual help, self-aid and so on. How do we give them equal recognition? Because they play in directly into the development needs at the grassroots level. Mutual aid, the word already says it. There is a need at a community grassroots level and we are helping each other. You are because I am principal, but we don't recognize them because the structures we set are exclusive because also the funding and partnerships that we build do not allow us or do not create that space for us to include these principles. And it falls back to us to do those recognition and say, when we go and negotiate with our partners, with our donors, with our friends to say, yes, it's good we want to count the contributions of volunteerism coming from the globe or from formal volunteer programs, but could we also include the following formats of volunteerism as well in it? But again, this can only happen if we ourselves know our agendas, if we have read our own constitutions, our own plans of development, that's that's the only way we can sit down and say this is my priority this is where you come in and assist me 
uh, it is with that mind and uh, that the African Union has set up two initiatives. Um, the first one, and Robert, thank you, you have mentioned that already, is the AU Volunteer uh, Corps. It was set up uh, as one of the implementation instruments of the Youth Charter, where we say, how do we establish integration of the continent? Uh, and one way is to tap into the vast resource of volunteerism and young people uh, to drive integration and unity on the Pan-African agenda through volunteerism. And the second one, since about four years or so, is the Volunteer Linkage Platform. I invite you all to visit volunteer.africa, uh, where we register all volunteer initiatives on the continent, be it national, grassroots, international, or um, uh, how do you call it, civil society-led volunteer programs. Uh, this data would then help us to count and measure what volunteerism is contributing, and together with partners, we would be able to issue our own report at the continental level, what is volunteerism contributing to the development of Africa and so on. And such initiatives or such writing your own story and, and borrowing the pot, uh, uh, Robert Ray used as one of the pan African say, by writing our own story, we're not waiting for somebody to come and tell us to write a story, but we start somewhere. It will not be perfect the first time. It will not be perhaps inclusive of all the information data required, but the fact that we start and continue the push is the very first step in the right direction, we believe. And we, uh, of course, count on every uh, African uh, citizen, an African program to contribute to this uh, success of this work as it is our joint program. Uh, let me pause here, Sam, uh, hand over to you, and then I can come back should there be more questions and in the discussion time. Thank you, Sam, over to you. Thank you, Daniel, appreciate it. Thanks a lot. And again, I'll say my you that you can have your say on the Q&A session. I'm already seen some are coming in. Please share your comments about what you think. If you have a question, so any question or comment for our speakers, they are happy to respond to you during the Q&A session. Let us remind you that the webinar has been organized by IAV in collaboration with Africa Union. This is a celebration of the International Volunteers Day to provoke this kind of conversation in the bit of like developing volunteering in the continent and across. I am Samuel Tule. I am the coordinator for the IAV Global Network of Volunteering Leadership in Africa. I now hand over this uh, the mic to Mary to present and followed by um, Declady. So Mary, over to you. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, good day. Greetings to everybody. Thank you, Samuel, for the opportunity. And thank you to the gentlemen that went before me. They really uh, covered quite a lot. So as mentioned, my name is Mary Mlambo. I am from an organization based in Richards Bay, KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa, Lungelo Youth Development. I'm from the civil society. And really for me is to bring everybody down to the level of uh, what we call grassroots, where you know, all the work happens on the ground. And my first slide would be on a TED talk by a Nigerian born writer who's now based in the US, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, when she talks about the danger of a single story. So one of the challenges with colonialism or col colonialism in volunteerism is that you know, there has always been a single story. Um, volunteerism, the, the global north, 
when they sell volunteerism to the young people or anybody that wants to go, especially to the global south, to go and volunteer, it is from their side of their story, which is now the, the, the danger because it's from the stereotype, it's from um, what they think, it's from what everybody says when they talk about global south, they talk poverty, they talk corruption, they talk um, hunger, they talk, let's go out and help. And that is a danger because now based on that, we establish, we, we really need to establish bonds so that with mutual respect and through working together, people's livelihoods can be improved and a better understanding of each other's realities can be achieved. At the moment, we, we struggle to achieve uh, what volunteerism is supposed to be, the objective of volunteerism. We are busy with the stereotypes and some people, especially from the global north, when they come to the south, they find themselves um, lost because what they were told and what they were sold and the reality when they got here get to the global south is totally different from what they know. Now, we need to look at the colonial mindset. And I know that this is a very difficult conversation to have. However, as the world moves forward, as we say we want to decolonize, we need to have very frank, difficult conversations. We need to talk about these things. We need to unpack the colonial mind to say, we need to move away from that and moving away from colonialism, moving away from the colonial mindset, moving away from doing things the colonial way will not work if we do not talk frankly with each other, if we do not attend to issues head on, find solutions. Because now we basically just putting a plaster over a bleeding wound. And that is, you know, it's likely to open up and keep bleeding again, and we're not helping anybody. So we need to move away from the colonial mindset. And my view is volunteering in the developed world should not be positioned as a safe Africa expedition. Volunteering in the developing world should not be, should not appear like a tool to import cheap labor. So when we send people from the global south to the global north, the global north should not see it as, oh, we're getting cheap labor. Having said that, also our mindset from the global south, we still, there's still work to be done for us to be decolonized because now we always feel like we have to bow down to the master. We have to listen to the, what, what the global north says. When we get there, we forget that we came there on an equal footing to be a volunteer, to share in everything that everybody does. Instead, we say, say I am here, um, I'm ready to do what you want me to do. Instead of saying, right, let us agree on what I'm supposed to be doing. The inequality of exchange programs often leads to the perpetuation of colonial behaviors. I think I've just mentioned that. Money is normally used as the power to manipulate volunteerism by the global north. You know, that's as if the resources required for volunteerism, it's only about money. If you do not have money, then you just have to take what is put on the table. You just have to take what comes your way. We need to move away from that. Global South might not have the money for, for volunteerism. Let us not use the, the material resources to, to, to manipulate because there's also other resources that people have that can actually assist in volunteerism. Um, Global South should not feel that we are at the mercy of the North. Volunteering, because it's obligatory to do so by the state. Okay, that sentence is not complete. So some global north, uh, and, and Dr. Towi and Daniel alluded to that, because it is, it is mandated, it is regulated by the government, they find themselves 
funding volunteer programs. However, those volunteer programs are more like a tell. You know, you, you get told that from the South, if you have to go, here is the criteria. I respect that somebody that is investing money in a program, they have to set the criteria. Um, however, how have you come to that criteria without engaging me in a conversation so that we can agree on a criteria uh, for that? So because the state is paying for it, you always get reminded that it is the state's money, is the taxpayer's money. So maybe the taxpayers should keep their money, the country should keep their money, not import um, volunteers, because now that is coming with a colonial mindset that I will tell you what to do. Okay, so also my view is that the colonial mindset says all things African are not good enough. Hence, you do not see a lot of South-South exchanges. We are painted, and maybe to some degree, we have allowed that to happen. Yes, it is something we carried from colonialism, but over the years, as the, as the global South, we have allowed the world to have that way of thinking about us. We are not good enough. We are not professional. We are not able to do nothing good comes out of Africa. Nothing good, only the negatives, only the downward spiral comes from there. And it's time that we change that. And you know, it is not always easy for the colonial who previously had this power to manipulate, to control, that they can actually come and say, all right, now you change, we want to help you to change your way of thinking to now be decolonized. It's up to us as well to invest in ourselves. And we've got a lot of scholars, we've got a lot of people that are really educated and they did researches and they've got the know-how. The important thing is that we need to stop being selfish. We need to start working together as different stakeholders to, to, to decolonize our minds. So for me, changing mindsets is revisiting policies that govern volunteerism because I, I know that you know, Daniel mentioned that the African Union has got some policies and even all the different countries, we've got our, our um, strategic plans that have got policies that govern volunteerism. But people on the ground that are supposed to know that, the civil society that is implementing all those policies, that is the first point of call for volunteers to be able to to get volunteers to work in the civil society organizations, to get volunteers for selection, to be selected to go and volunteer elsewhere in the world. Those people do not know those policies. So we've got great policies, we've got great strategies, but they are packaged in a way that nobody really understands the language because it's at a level where some parties do not even understand it. So we really need to visit, to revisit those policies that govern volunteerism. We need to take ownership of volunteer programs that fit in our own agenda, not anything that comes from, from the higher powers that are, because the volunteerism policies, volunteerism strategies has to fit into the agenda that the organizations, that civil society works in, not what somebody assumes that this is how things are supposed to be. We need to move volunteerism from an, end, from an endeavor of the privileged youth from developed nations. So the privileged youth from developed nations, you know, they've got the money, they've got the resources, they've got all that it takes. They come to the global south saying we are coming to volunteer. And when they get here, they find themselves now thinking, oh, I am on a holiday, you know. So they also need to understand that this is not a holiday. You need to respect the civil society. You need to respect where you are going to volunteer. Do not go there with the I know it all attitude. Go with, I am a volunteer. I am going to learn. I'm going to share experiences with other people. We are different. And nobody who says your way of doing things is the right way. You know, we all have got to respect each other's cultures each other's 
religions and each other's way of doing things. Of course, we're here to develop each other. However, it's important to respect each other. Volunteerism is changing from a stay, save the, okay, that I've mentioned already. We need to have frank conversations. How, so colonialism shaped volunteerism, even though in the global South and specifically in this case in Africa, I'm speaking from the point that I know, in Africa, we have got, we, volunteerism has something, is something that has always been there. It is something that is happening on a daily basis. We just have not labeled it and call it volunteerism, but it, there is always a way of assisting, a way of supporting each other. So because the Global North packaged it and put a label on it and call it vol volunteerism, now, they have got a way of managing and controlling it. So I'm saying, let us come back, decolonize volunteerism. Let us talk about it and come to workable solutions that works for everybody. How we need to reposition volunteerism is that we need to be, Africa needs to be seen as an equal partner. Africa has to be involved, has to be engaged in the conversations that shape volunteerism. Take volunteerism, the take up on volunteerism has, has been accelerated by globalization that has helped the world to become one big community. And we are moving in that direction. And, and you know, especially during the time of COVID, it showed us that as the world we need each other, as the world we're facing um, same challenges, during those difficult times of COVID, almost in every country in the world, we used volunteers, volunteers worked to assist, to, to, to save, to, to ensure that everybody is safe, assisted each other. So we can see that we actually need each other. We all have got the same challenges. It doesn't matter which part of the world you're sitting in. Um, we also need to rise up as Africans and be accountable and responsible for us to earn respect and recognition. Colonialism has made the world, and unfortunately, even the upcoming generations are growing up with that. It's going to take a while for this to die down. We cannot roll over and die as Africans and say, oh, well, this is how the world sees us. So we are going to continue as being uh, perceived to be unaccountable and not responsible. We really have to rise up and we have to, to claim this space. And if we are going to claim this space, we need to reposition ourselves. We need to say, we are here to assist correct the, the, the errors of the past. We're here to assist correct the, the colonialism uh, history because we cannot keep on carrying on that history. We cannot keep on reading, you know, uh, Chimamanda Ngozi Adisha talks about the books that she was reading. And when she was writing books, she was also writing about a, a blue eyed, long hair, blonde hair girl. We don't have that in Africa. So we cannot allow that to still dictate because that comes from colonialism. We cannot allow that to still dictate how we shape uh, volunteerism. And my last point really on this is that I, I took it from what um, Dr. Toby said, that there is also non-formal volunteering. Volunteerism is not competition. Civil society need to understand that we need each other. We all work together. It does not matter where in the world you are. No form of volunteerism is better than another, whether it's informal volunteerism, whether it's formal volunteerism, it is packaged in a structured way, or it's just informal, somebody doing something small to assist in the community, it is still volunteerism. We need to reposition, we need to find a space where we accommodate all sorts of volunteerism. Um, so yeah, my last word is just to say, let us unite, let us mobilize, let us start thinking differently, let us shift our way of thinking and say, we can do this. We are coming together as a global community. We need volunteers, we need each other. Our young people uh, needs to be 
educated, need to be encouraged, needs to understand the importance of volunteerism. We cannot say the government has got money and they want to send you somewhere in the world to go volunteer because then they go with their own concept. We need to educate them so that they understand when they get into it, it's not just about this money to be spent, but it's also about why am I doing this? And this is what I want to do. I am a volunteer at heart. Um, thank you very much. Back to you, Sam, and I'll be here also for questions and clarity. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mary. Thanks for this presentation. So we move now to our last speaker, but again, I just want to remind you that you can have your say in the Q&A section. Just uh, post your comments or com uh, questions to our panelists. They are happy to as well answer your questions during the Q&A um, session. So I move on to the lady for our presentation and let's just be mindful of the time so that we give chance to answer questions or the participants also interact during the Q&A session. Thank you, over to you, Dr. Lady. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I am Dikyo Dimogwena. I am currently in Tanzania. I am a South African by birth and a lecturer at the Tabombeki African Leadership Institute, which has actually become the Tabombeki um, School of Public International Affairs, uh, which is located within the University of South Africa. I am also um, a lecturer, an associate lecturer at the Nelson Mandela University. Um, so apart from that, which is what I do professionally, um, I'm also into, I guess, social justice work. And the social justice work that I do filters um, across my profession, meaning I can do sort of um, a scholar activist work, um, but also within the civil society space as well. Um, so I just wanted to share that. And I think also in line, uh, in light of what was, um, I guess, mentioned earlier um, by doctors that, um, you know, the, the, the role that the academy could play in, in this. Um, although my uh, field of speciality in terms of um, supervision is not necessarily volunteerism, um, but I, my work is actually in decoloniality, gender, um, African political economy and so forth. Um, or rather to be more specific, um, I'm a political scientist by, by, by I guess, uh, disciplinary training. So um, I'm hoping that my screen is visible or my PPT is visible. Um, so I decided to share, I guess, my thoughts and reflections on the topic of decoloniality or other decolonization and volunteerism in the African continent, uh, but more specifically talking about decoloniality um, and, and, and be mindful that I would be speaking <laughs> relatively more as an academic. And, and that means I will be engaging in some level of conceptual discussions um, and then also be able to share, um, I guess, some of my thoughts in relation to some of the work that I have been doing academically um, also um, on the side as a, I guess, as an um, sort of as a social justice activist. So I, interestingly also, <laughs> uh, there's an organization that I co-founded, which is Afro Sawa. Um, largely focus on young women uh, in leadership. So we've largely been basically operating within the African continent um, thus far. Um, on a low key basis, we're still literally at our infancy level. So in a sense, um, part of what we're doing also is somewhat encouraging young people or young women rather uh, to pursue the leadership roles and part of that is also about um, you know servant leadership and a part of the servant leadership um, does involve elements of volunteerism in their communities. Okay so now um, I would like to sort of differentiate between uh, decolonization and decoloniality of which decoloniality is a framework that I actually work with in my own work. My PhD was on this. Um, so, so decolonization and this uh, concept, I mean, the definition that, um, um, that I do not uh, solely come up with, it is, it's been inspired by other scholars. 
um, whom unfortunately I do not um, cite them here. So, so decolonization refers to legislative demise of colonialism uh, through which is basically has been colonialism through direct control, um, indirect control or semi-control by a foreign economic, political, social, cultural dominance in a specific territory. Okay, decoloniality refers to the continuities of colonial systems, structures, institutions, cultures, thoughts, and ideologies of Western empires and former colonies long after the empire ceased political administration and control of the colonies, which means in as much as we did receive independence, we began to have see a wave of independence, political independence in the continent, you know, from the 60s onwards, um, up until the 1990s, um, for for some countries, and of course, we still have other um, countries that still need to 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 gain their independence. But I'll not get into that conversation. Um, irrespective of that political independence, we still unfortunately see certain continuities in terms of the systems of colonialism, the structures of colonialism, and also the cultural ethos that tends to shape and influence um, how we tend to think, uh, behave, and also interact with one another. And I think this is partly um, somewhat a framework that we can actually use to explain some of the arguments that have been made uh, before, like for instance, by Ndata Robert and, uh, and uh, Memeri um, regarding, you know, sort of the idea of colonial mentality as well, the idea of perceiving um, other volunteers as more professional or, or thinking that programs from the West are actually more superior, et cetera, et cetera. So those kinds of notions are actually um, a way of thinking on that kind of particular consciousness is a result um, of the continuities in terms of the colonial legacy um, that we unfortunately continue to suffer uh, many years post-independence. And this has been facilitated and continues to be reinforced by coloniality. So Professor Ndrovukajeni, Sifreso Ndrovukajeni, uh, who's Zimbabwean by birth, he's a historian, um, currently based in, 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 in the North, if I were to put it that way, um, defined colonialism uh, by explaining, or rather, that, um, or rather explained colonialism as a very complex power structure that transforms a people's way of life. Um, he went on to say that colonialism is um, the invention of asymmetrical and colonial intersubjective relations between the colonizer and the colonized. And it economically institutes dispossession, um, as it has been noted in many instances in many other countries in terms of land dispossession, right? Economic uh, um, uh, dispossession, so the dispossession of resources that would enable those communities and those countries to thrive economically. And of course, contemporary, you have other contemporary ways in which dispossession also continues to, to take place. Um, and then he then went on to say that it also um, involved the transfer of economic resources from those who are indigenous to those who are conquering and foreign. He went on to say that it claims to be a civilizing project, meaning those who colonized came in and they were like, oh, these savages, let us actually make them better. So by way to make them better is actually for us to teach them our ways of doing things and our ways of doing things consequently also then meant um, sort of religious um, way or rather uh, uh, their own way of um, thinking about what religion and religious practice or relationship with God or the divine for that matter. Um, it also meant, um, you know, civilizing in a sense of what actually an economy or economic activity actually constitutes. And I think also we somewhat continue to see this, particularly when we are also talking about development, um, when we're also talking about aspects such as um, what is volunteerism. So the idea of um, sort of uh, traditional volunteerism vis-a-vis -vis so-called formal um, uh, volunteerism, which tends to be more um, measured and accepted and noted as opposed to other informal forms, which seems to be actually the much more predominant form of volunteerism in the African continent. So um, yeah, anyway, so so he then, like I said, uh, 
so the economic resource I've read that it claims to be a civilizing project. I've already read that as it hides its sinister mo motives. The project also creates institutions and structures of power that sustain colonizer and colonized relations of exploitation, domination, and repression. Even when you push back colonization as a physical process, an epistemic project, because it invades the mental universe of a people, destabilizing them from what they used to know into knowing what is brought in by colonialism, and it commits crimes such as epistemicide, which is basically displacing and disregarding pre-existing knowledges of a people. And part of that, if you are to talk about development and volunteerism, that would mean what are indigenous notions of what development is? What are the indigenous notions of what volunteerism is? And now consequently, those ideas of what development is, the ideas of um, what volunteerism is in those particular communities tends to be replaced or or marginalized or disregarded, right? And that particular is what is called um, epistemicide. And he also mentions that um, the, this particular crime that is uh, committed by colonialism is linguicide. And an example, perfect example of this is the fact that at this particular moment, we are actually conversing in English, representing in a colonial language, which means then a lot of our own indigenous language tend to be displaced. And this has been a global phenomena, basically whereby colonialism um, made its way. And then also he then speaks um, of the concept of a cultural site, right? That is basically um, sort of a genocide, but a genocide of a people's culture. And that particular culture of the indigenous people tends to be then replaced by a foreign colonial form of what culture is. So basically, the, if you think about that in the total, then we get to appreciate literally the implication of what colonialism was and what colonialism continues, or rather its legacy, what it continues to actually um, have I mean, to have an, in terms of impact in the African continent um, today. So this consequently then means that, um, I mean, this particular definition or his explanation, actually, I think, I believe, I'd like to believe that it helps us realize that actually, you know, colonialism was more than just the colonial administration of a foreign power, um, you know, in a specific territory. So it helps us appreciate the complexity. It helps us to appreciate actually what really happened when it came to colonialism. And I think once we're able to do that, then we can and then be able to think around how all the ways in which we can actually respond to that, right? But of course, what coloniality um, also means in a sense is that um, as a concept, what it does is it, it does not limit itself only to countries that have been fought or have been colonized before, right? So you may have countries that were never colonized, yet you may find coloniality in those contexts, right? Of course, the coloniality would be in a particular, in a particular form. And, and and I think that's that's something that um, that is quite interesting, which which also would call for people who are I mean researchers to actually go into those spaces to try and explain um, more and take sort of uh, or rather help us understand more of how coloniality manifests in those spaces whereby colonialism was never really a, a political um, phenomena or a reality in those contexts. Yet today, due through um, globalization, you are seeing coloniality in those spaces, in those countries. So coloniality, um, rather than you think about, um, I guess the colonial or decolonial scholars then think about this idea of epistemology, right? Epistemology is a way of knowing. Um, I'm just going to skip that particular um, quote, which basically um, highlights basically the ways in which um, the West or specifically Eurocentricity has been dominating um, the global sphere. So Crossford Girl, which is an American, I'm sorry, a Latin American scholar, argued that um, we need to, whenever we then think about concepts um, or any form of knowledge that comes from wherever, right? Um, it can be, it can be in America, it can be in Europe, it can be literally anywhere. We need to be mindful that any concept, whether it is development, we must not never ever assume that there is no um, subjectivity, meaning there is no personal. Um, as sort of personal views or personal biases that tend to shape and influence how we then conceptualize certain phenomena or certain things. And in this case, it would be development, right? So meaning we cannot assume that development is really this neutral thing 
um, that you know can be globalized and actually applied everywhere but we need to actually be mindful that it is actually quite value specific meaning it is specific to a particular values of a specific region in the world and in this case would be the global north we need to be mindful that development also speaks um, or that it's also influenced or how we think about it is influenced by specific culture of a certain people from um i guess the global north so these are aspects that what in a sense when you then think about the locus of enunciation that's literally what um what cross vocal in this case he forces us to do right to anything any concept that comes in and it's the same thing with volunteerism as well right as a concept that it is important to then deconstruct so look at it deconstruct and ask yourself so I see this particular concept. I see now you're talking about development, but what does this development mean, right? Who actually came up with this particular, and I think this is what also Danielle mentioned earlier, you know, and what are the values um, that actually I espouse and are also embedded within this particular good notion of what development is, right? And in that case, does that mean if you are then to decolonize um, and also Africanize development for our own context, does development in this case carry and explain um, or carry rather the aspirations of the cultural beliefs, um, the cultural practices and um, the cultural thoughts of indigenous people of Africa, right? So those literally would be some of the questions um, that we'd have to um, enforce or, or, or bring about. So anyway, so consequently, we see conceptions of development and volunteerism, which need then to be decolonized, right? And then largely, this has been what um, our former speakers have been saying before, in a, in a nutshell. So um, one of the other things is that is, you know, for, I guess, for me, um, and a lot mm -hmm. of other colonial scholars, in the sense of then thinking about um, the global side as a site of epistemic resistance, meaning this becomes an opportunity for Africans um, to then think and creatively think about, so what does volunteerism actually mean for us, right? So what is this I, going to actually... The, the credit, I, I'm sorry, I, I think um, the time we Fine. are located there is almost running, like I just alerted okay. you. So yeah, let me just uh, um, let me just yeah move on to the the other slides, which which then um yeah anyway, so okay. so yeah to move to to I guess pass by uh, that is then you thinking about um well this slide was much more of a journey right sort of what what then I think in terms of us um at a much more subjective individual level what really inspires us to actually do volunteer work and i think for me personally it was largely thinking about this particular view um as a pan-africanist so i used to um and and this is not a new although this is statistics that speaks to 2022 um the the unfortunate aspect is that this has been a a, a reality for a long time that you have this beautiful big continent which unfortunately economically is not doing very well right in terms of development or, or economic growth um so are you I may have to play it on your um, please. I know because of um, we have a lot more to cover, the clarity, and then I feel the slides will be shared and people will be able to follow up on this side. I know earlier we promised to give some little time to answer the question from our participants. We're expecting their um, their time here and then begin to honor the their the question they've asked. So I may want to now come to all the panelists, including no yourself. Eddie, I'm sorry about that because of the time. We are just a few more minutes to the end of the webinar. So please, I would love to in, in, um, invite all the webinar to put your um, camera on and then um, um, we can come to the Q&A and then open the Q questions that have been asked by participants to all of you so we can spend the next um, two to three minutes to answer those questions and then we come to the end of the webinar. Um, I will go now directly to the Q&A. The first questions we have there is come from um, Nigo Smola asking what makes the nothing more professional and less professional to the um, South. That's um, one question. So I'm, I, I'm, I'm talking directly now to the panelists to be able to just throw a light into this. And the other questions we have is um, the, this is Great Initiative. It's from Elizabeth. Um, um, the, the question is that how, how prepared are we as Africans to embrace this change in terms of human? human capital, resources, technology, and the enabling environment. And then we have um, another question. So what do you think about the independency of African uh, association to European fund for some of the welcoming volunteers from the North? It's a way to get this fund and finance their activity 
which that the influence of the global north persist on Africa and guide their actions and my opinion that's contribution to the neocolonialism. So I want to send this conversation to all the panelists uh, here at the moment. Um, please put your camera on so we just have uh, one, two minutes response or reflections to these questions Then we can come to the end of this webinar. Over to any one of you if you want to address any of the questions, um, you feel like this question, if you are in the position to address them. Robotre, Daniel, uh, maybe. Let me, let me come in. Yes, please. Yes, <laughs> about this, uh, this aspect of uh, 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 volunteer from the North being professional. So just a perception that I mentioned, it doesn't mean in reality that's the case. Of course, uh, you, can, you can have some time uh, volunteer from North uh, who are more professional than volunteer from the South and, and vice versa. It's, uh, I, I, I put it that we should not uh, get in our mind that this is always the case. Because uh, as the, some of the uh, presenter mentioned, this mindset that uh, still is there sometimes make that we think that anything that comes from the North is better than what we have in the South. It could be in the area of volunteers, could be even in goods, uh, the clothes we are wearing, and uh, uh, mentioned that even we are speaking currently in foreign languages. Why we could not have two or three key languages in the entire Africa that we all speak and be able to exchange when we have this type of a meeting? So that's, that's the idea I wanted to put across, not that I was uh, saying that they are more professional than us. Okay. Of course, you are professional, yeah. And okay. the second point that I want quickly to address is this independency of African organization from Northern Fund. Again, we are not saying that we should close ourselves to, uh, to the outside world, but we're saying if, if we want to do it, let's do it in a win-win situation. Okay. I think that's the, the key point. So okay. whenever we have to enter into partnership with uh, any organization outside our continent, let's sit down, discuss, and be sure that what we want out of it is for our good as well. Not just because we are interested in fun, we accept any condition they will impose on us. That was the point I was trying to, to make when I talk about a good partnership, where you share resources, power, decision-making, so forth, you will see in the presentation I mentioned all the points that we need to take into account anytime we enter in a partnership with any foreign uh, organization. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Sorry, I had wished to um, have a conversation longer than this time, but we all know time has never been enough to have such kind of conversation. And of course, um, we in the IRV and the GNBL, including the Africa Union, will be more keen to extend the conversation to another series where we can deeply have other participants from the other side, including the North and the Latin America, to have an extensive discussion on this. This is too big of a topic to address in this one session, but we just start this in line with a recognition of the International Volunteers Day, where we can have a conversation like this to looking at other approaches and programs we take in Africa, really respond to the context in Africa and how we can make volunteering owned by African organizations or Africans in general. So I want to thank every participant who has spent their time um, going to um, the one or 30 minutes we've spent in this webinar. I also want to thank the speakers who have spent their time to give us an insightful presentations that have actually changed some mindset or conversations going forward. We're looking forward to working with all partners who are interested in this kind of conversation to come together and advance the discussion moving forward. In IAVI, we are open to looking at how we collaborate with institutions who are willing to work in line with this um, kind of um, discussion moving forward. So I want to thank you all for the time that you've taken. We hope that we will get you in our future webinars where we'll have an extensive discussion on this again. Thank you all once again for your comments and the questions. We have to address them, but the slides will be shared to all of you as you have actually requested for it. Thanks once again for your time. On behalf of myself and the rest of the entire the Africa Union team, I include the Nayabi team. 
Bye bye and have a pleasant international volunteers day to you. Thank you bye. so much. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Cheers. Bye bye. Thank you very much. And thank you to the colleagues who share their views with us. As I said, it's always a learning process when we go through that. And I found that all the presentations were very complimentary. Absolutely. Definitely. I totally agree with you. Thank you. This is a very rich conversation. We hope that we can have a conversation more like this again. Thank you so much for everyone. Indeed. indeed. Thank you, Mr. Chair.